what I discovered was that these people could not connect with sadness. They could not connect with grief. They could not connect with anything that seemed more difficult. And I wrote about these people, and I just pulled the term out of the air, perfectly hidden depression, because they were also usually very perfectionistic people. Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset. This is a podcast that's all about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. In every episode, we go deep with engaging guests who provide tangible takeaways and a whole lot of joy along the way. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. Let's dive into today's show. I'm Larry Sprung, your host for the Midland Money Mindset and founder and wealth advisor of Midland Financial. Today's guest is Dr. Margaret Rutherford, clinical psychologist, author, TEDx speaker, and podcast host. Dr. Rutherford, a clinical psychologist with 30 years of experience, is known for her vibrantly engaging and theoretically well-crafted presentations. She delivers the message that healthy mental and emotional lives can be created through becoming more transparent with one another. Sharing who you really are with those you trust is a huge step towards connection and good mental health. Rates of depression and suicide are skyrocketing, and there is something we can do. Margaret is also challenging the mental health profession to question their over-reliance on the official symptom checklist for diagnosis. Instead, we need to create normalcy around suicidal feelings, listen to each person's actual experience of their life, and respond with safety and compassion rather than stigmatizing this very real and painful part of human existence. Dr. Margaret is also known for her book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression, and also her highly popular podcast, The Self Work Podcast. It has been continuously rated as one of the best podcasts for mental health and depression. Listen in for some great takeaways on how we can reduce the stigma that surrounds mental health and suicide to help both those near and far. Well, hello. I have the pleasure today of being with Dr. Margaret Rutherford, clinical psychologist, author, TEDx speaker, and podcast host. Thank you for joining us today, Margaret. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Larry, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for taking out the time. And I know about you. I know a bit about your background, but I also want to have a little bit of a basis for our listeners to understand kind of your background and brought you to where you are doing all those things that we just discussed in the opening there. Can you give us a little background on your path to becoming a clinical psychologist, TEDx speaker, et cetera? Sure, of course. Well, I had a bit of a circuitous route to becoming a psychologist. I actually am a former professional singer. In my 20s, I sang jingles for a living, radio and television advertisements. I sang at night, did different gigs with, I was a terrible rock and roll singer. I was absolutely awful. (laughs) But I sang some jazz standards better. So I did that for six to eight years, something like that. And then I heard something about music therapy, and I was very interested in that. I was not a psychology major in college. But I had started volunteering at the Battered Women's Shelter there in Dallas, and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, okay, well, let me go in that direction because I'm not too happy as a the lifestyle of a professional singer is really rough. So it wasn't quite up my alley. But then in my training for music therapy at Southern Methodist University, I did an internship in a psych hospital and I'd gotten a lot of therapy in my 20s. And I thought, ah, no, 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 this is what I want to do. So Larry, it actually took me nine years to go from singing for a living and closing down the Fairmont Hotel at one o'clock in the morning to seeing my first patients as a clinical psychologist. So it took a lot of persistence. It took a lot of belief. It took a lot of help and wonderful support from my family and friends. But I kind of turned my boat around and did something else. So I've loved being a therapist My husband and I moved to Fable, Arkansas in 1992, and I began my practice there. I've been practicing in Dallas, Texas, but 
began practicing here in Arkansas. And then what led me to the podcast was we were lucky enough to have one son and he went to college and I had all this time on my hands. So I started writing on social media. And then I discovered this concept called Perfectly Hidden Depression. And I was trying to sell a book or a book concept. And the publisher said, this is a really good book, but nobody knows who you are. (laughs) So I thought, okay, what would I enjoy doing? I'll get back behind a microphone and I'll do a podcast. So I'm very lucky that the Self-Work Podcast has done extremely well, and it's been very well mined, has it one of the 10 best depression podcasts in 2023, and it's gotten other kinds of awards like that. That's what brought me to all of this and to you and to your listeners. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. So before we jump into a deeper dive into some of the stuff you're up to now, I have to ask, are there any jingles we would know? Oh, <laughs> well, let's see. The Dallas people listening know the Fox photo used to be a big thing. And I, let's see, I was the Fox photo girl. I was the TJ Maxx girl. I sang, a, it's Southwest Airlines home. Just say when. I did that one one time. <laughs> All right. So there were some big household names that people would know for sure. Sure. <laughs> Amazing. So what was the impetus? What was the drive for you to becoming a therapist? In the first place, was there some internal drive other than, hey, this is something I think I enjoy and could be good at? I know one of the things you did kind of dovetail into that is you put a lot of your tips and advice online. So what made you do that? So I guess what was the reasoning behind becoming a therapist and what made you to kind of just put all that stuff out there rather than, I guess, keeping it to yourself? Or making people pay for it. Right. right? Some of my clients say, hey, you're putting online (laughs) what we're paying for. That doesn't seem quite right. Well, I'll tell you, for one thing, I got really good therapy my whole life. My, I will share with your listeners and you, my decade of my 20s was very chaotic. I was making terrible decisions. I had two divorces during, two marriages and two divorces during that time. I was being controlled by things I didn't understand from my past. And therapy helped me figure that out. Graduate school helped me figure that out as well. I was very appreciative of what other therapists had done for me. As I said in earlier, I was drawn out of the music business because of, frankly, it's a very narcissistic business and I didn't particularly care for it. But what I found was, especially in graduate school, that I had not gone from school to school to school. I'd gotten out and kind of had some hard knocks and some created by myself, I might add. So I had some life experience to bring, and I have a very mm, kind of let's get down to business, common sense approach to doing things. And when I began getting onto social media, and especially the podcast, there's a lot of misinformation out there about what therapy is and what therapeutic change means and how hard it is or how easy it is or the prevalence of mental health disorders and what problems people have that aren't even classified as mental health disorders. So I was really drawn to try to bring some kind of, I wanted people to experience a therapist that wasn't really woo-woo and (laughs) made sense and talked about what you can do about it and talked about these are the things you can try. I can't read the future, but I've been a therapist for 30 years now. So I'm sort of a conduit between People I've seen in the past that I've learned from who have had tragedies, horrible tragedies in their lives, and then somehow have found the persistence, the courage, the resilience to, and have had done a lot of grieving to get through that. And I feel like I'm a conduit between those people and the people that that is just happening to. So I have been a learner along the way, and I pass along what I've learned, not necessarily what I know myself, some of what I know myself, but what I've learned from other people along the way. What was the impetus in you putting it all out there online initially? Well, I don't know how else to do it. I mean, frankly, it's an interesting question to try to answer because I'm not sure what you mean by put it all out there. Can you define that for me? 
Well, my understanding is, and I saw you kind of put advice and tips online to help market, I guess, your practice and how you help people, right? It's never been about my practice. My practice, knock on wood, here, I'll do it right now, has always been full. I mean, yeah, not my first six months, but certainly in the last 29 years, it's been full. So this was never about getting new clients, ever. So what was the impetus? What was it? It was about, well, I, I hope I've explained, but let me say it again, to try to get information to people who can't afford to go to a therapist, who this was way before we had better help or talk space or any of those that are a little bit less expensive, much less expensive, but to try to give people some information that would be helpful to them that they could in private, in the privacy of going on a walk or in their home or they're doing household chores or they're taking the kids to school or whatever, driving home from work, and they could listen to, okay, this is what I think might be helpful for you to think about. I greatly admire people like Esther Perel, who are doing actual therapy sessions online. And I did that for a while on a on an app called Meal Mind. But I think people can learn from listening and trying things out. And certainly I've had people tell me they've listened for a long time and that it has been helpful to them because it gives them hope. When you've never been depressed, when you've never had a panic attack, when you've never had a trauma happen and you have PTSD, you don't know what to do. Sometimes you don't even know it has a name. So I'm trying to get that information out to people. Sounds like a great way to bring it to the masses, for sure. One of the things you talk about and use the term perfectly hidden depression, I find that term very interesting. Could you share with our listeners what you mean by that? So it was in 2014 and I was writing my just typical weekly blog post And I was thinking about some people that I had tried to help and hopefully did through the years. When they walked in my door, Larry, they would never say they were depressed. In fact, they would vehemently tell you that they had way too many blessings in their life to be depressed. They had enough money. They had a lovely family. They had a good job. They had all these things going for them. But what I began to see in these people was that they could not express painful emotion. In fact, they might be telling me something that was painful, like a tornado ripping through their house. I'll just give that as an example. And they kind of smile at me and say, yeah, gosh, that was rough. And I'm not sure how we got through it, but we did. And they just kind of smile and nod. And I looked at him like, gosh, did you lose all your family photographs? Did you, how did you grieve? Oh, we had each other. And Oh my gosh. So what I discovered was that these people could not connect with sadness. They could not connect with grief. They could not connect with anything that seemed more difficult. And I wrote about these people and I just pulled the term out of the air, perfectly hidden depression, because they were also usually very perfectionistic people. Well, that post went viral. I never had a post go viral before. It was called the perfectly hidden depressed person. Are you one? And I was writing for the HuffPost at the time. They published it. And I got hundreds, literally hundreds of emails. How do you know about this? It's like you're in my head. I've had thoughts of hurting myself, but now I'm going to talk to my family. So I got curious. Never wanted to write a book. Have never idea of writing a book. And I looked, I found Dr. Brene Brown's work, wonderful work on vulnerability and shame and all this stuff. I found Terrence Reel's book for men, which was called, I don't want to talk about it, that called, that called out covert depression, but I didn't see anything. And I know you said, this is a family show. We're going to talk about suicide a little bit. So, but I had never seen anything that actually looked at perfectionism, depression, and the potential of suicide. That's what I found in the academic literature, that people were really concerned about this, and this was growing. So it's a huge phenomenon. I want to take a quick break from the show to talk to you about our latest best-selling book, Financial Planning Made Personal. It breaks down complex financial concepts into simple, easy-to-follow steps that anyone can understand. Everyone has a unique financial journey, and this book can help yours. Do you have your copy yet? If not, please go to financialplanningmadepersonal.com and order one today. And I have one more question for you. 
What did you do today that brought you joy? Let's talk about this perfection thing a little bit further, because Mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been known for is I use the term practice makes permanent. And I'm very intentional about that. We've been intentional about that with our kids. Why do you feel striving for perfection can be such a dangerous thing? It isn't if it's about constructive perfectionism. If it's about an innate sense of, I want to do this well because I feel better when I do that. I want to be generous. I want to be kind. I want to be successful. I want to be whatever it is. All of that is fine. But so often, Larry, perfectionism is actually a camouflage for when what you've practiced and you've gotten really good at, you've gotten it's permanently entrenched to use your practice makes permanent, is that you've learned to hide all these things that happened to you as a child, you've learned to hide that trauma. In fact, you don't even call it trauma. You don't even call it anything. Oh, it's just what happened. Instead of practice making permanent in a good way, practice makes permanent in a dangerous way. I've had people email me all the time about their family members who have killed themselves very suddenly and very shockingly They had everything in the world. They were kind, generous, loving, caring people who seemed to have been keeping a secret. And the secrecy and the shame about that secrecy is what generally was so potent for them and why they tried so hard to seem like their life was perfect. But on the inside, it was very dark and very despairing. Thank you for sharing that. Interesting. So one of the things I like to throw in here for the business owners, the entrepreneurs who are listening, because I think it's fascinating, the whole TED Talk genre and, and being able to do one. Can I ask, how did you go about securing your TED Talk? What was the impetus there? What was the process there for others who may be thinking about going that route? I had thought about it in the past, but I will tell you, it was another sort of synergistic thing. I got a LinkedIn connection from a woman in Florida. And actually, it was two women from Florida. And they reached out to me and they said, we've heard about perfectly hidden depression. Would you be willing to talk to us about it? I said, of course, (laughs) I'll talk to anybody about it because I'm so passionate about it. Well, they'd had one of those friends who was well-known in the community, mother of two, had a great marriage, supposedly, Nothing was wrong in her life, volunteer at the wazoo, had her own business, and she killed herself. And her husband came up to one of those people at her funeral and said, I found this on my wife's bedside table, and it was my book. So we got to be friends. I did some speaking to a couple of women's organizations there in Florida. Well, lo and behold, Larry, as life would have it, one of them was a TEDx organizer. And I had no clue about that. (laughs) So I was just going about the business of trying to be available to people. Now, that's luck. A lot of that is luck. And what I've learned since is that actually, and again, I had no agenda, but getting to know who the TEDx organizers in your community are is a really good way. I think I talked to a guy in the construction world, is a really Vince Huffley is his name. And he said he applied to, I don't know, 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 TEDx's before someone was really interested in his story. You can try and try and try again, but I think a little bit of luck is always good. Being in the right place going at the right time. TEDx's in your community and getting to know the organizers. If you have an idea, the TEDx people want to know. They don't want to know just about a problem. They want to know about a unique solution to the problem, something that's going to add to the conversation. Again, ideas worth sharing. I guess they saw not only my idea about perfectly hidden depression, but some of my ideas about how we can talk about suicide as also a unique kind of conversation that's not been had by a lot of people. 
Well, thank you for sharing that story. I appreciate it. Earlier, you mentioned about your podcast was almost a little bit of a tool to help get you, I guess, more well-known for the book, right? That's what you you mentioned So I could actually get the book published, yes. It was not completely altruistic on my part. However, I will tell you that I was 62 when I started the podcast. This is now my eighth year of doing the podcast. And I was 62 and I thought, I'm 62 years old. I'm not about to do something that I'm not going to really enjoy doing. I don't want to become an influencer. I don't want to do this. I don't, that just, I don't want to take a bunch of pictures of myself. I don't want to do that. I thought I used to love being in front of a microphone. Maybe I can use that. My voice is kind of a good one for the radio or for whatever. And so I thought, all right, I'll try this out. And I just love it. So passion project, which is helped you get the book too, project. right? Mm-hmm. What is the impetus? What are you expecting or hoping that listeners take away from your show? Mm. Well, I love it when people write in and I actually answer their questions, either whether they email them to me or whether they send them in. We have a voicemail app on my website that they can use and I actually hear their voices asking me the question. I love to do that. But what I want people to take away from it is that there's nothing to be ashamed of about mental illness. I have panic disorder, Larry. I have performance anxiety. When I did that TEDx, I was having a major panic attack on stage. I mean, I was holding myself so tightly. People who know me can kind of tell that I was doing that, but every fiber of my being was holding on to me, not shaking because I was wanting to shake badly. But I had performance anxiety. I know exactly what a panic attack feels like. I've had anorexia in the past. I've been divorced twice. I know what mental health problems are. I know what depression is. I know what anxiety is. I also have a lot of blessings and there are people who a lot of their mental health issues are more tied with poverty and racism and discrimination and all these kinds of cultural issues that have nothing to do with anything really about mental health. Although mental health issues tend to accrue more than that because of poor treatment, they can't get to treatment, et cetera. So basically, what I want people to walk away with are some ideas about what they could do. How does this apply to my life or someone I love? I want some practical, pragmatic solutions to what they can try, what they can read, what they can write about, sources they can go to in their own communities. I think at the end of the day, I would imagine also to have them understand that whatever they're feeling or thinking, somebody else has felt or thought as well, right? They're not alone. They're not alone. Exactly. When I had my first panic attack, I didn't go to a therapist about it for about three years because I hid it because I was a very confident person. And I thought, oh my gosh, or I looked like a confident person. This isn't me. And I denied it until it started turning into social anxiety, where I couldn't even go into a party without shaking. But I thought, no, I don't know anybody who's had a panic attack. Well, sure enough, my mother had had panic attacks. My brother had had panic attacks. My grandfather had had panic attacks. I just didn't know that at the time. Panic is the number one mental health issue in the United States. So I think that that sense of aloneness, that sense of that's why I think other people's questions and stories and a lot of the authors that I interview have had problems in their own lives that they want to explain and they want to help people through. I don't have people as soon as I if I get an email, Larry, that says this speaker will transform your audience and they have a transformational method in just seven days. And I thought, "Mm -mm, not having them on. (laughs) It doesn't happen that quickly. So one of the things I, I found when I was researching and I came across for our conversation today was your use of the word, and I may be messing this up, fubbing. Oh, yeah. Could you share what fubbing is and why it's damaging to relationships? Fubbing is actually sort of snubbing with your cell phone. We see people doing it all the time. We see the people next to us at a table and they look like they're on a date or they're with their families and everybody is on their phone. It's the new way of sort of shutting someone out or stonewalling someone because you are actually on your phone. 
it's not something that I'm an expert in at all. I just happened to write a short post about it or an episode about it or something because I thought it was an interesting social phenomenon. I think something. it is. And I try to keep abreast of those kinds of things that are going on in our communities that are just not good for us having good quality relationships and maybe things that we're doing that we're not even aware that we're doing. I have talked a lot about the isolation of younger generations and the growing depression in those generations. And it is often tied to cell phone use and social media addiction, actually, or video addiction. Those who know me and my wife know that we're going on three years now as being empty nesters. Both the boys uh-huh. are out of the house. What tips do you have for those who gone from this environment where very busy home, kids, et cetera, to no kids at home. Any tips for those families experiencing that? When I first started blogging, I actually had a blog called Nest Ache because I made up another word. I guess I like making up words, Nest Ache and Self Work, because I was experiencing a lot of emptiness myself. We have one child and he went nine hours away to college and now he lives in L.A., So (laughs) that nest not only was empty, it's been empty a long time. I thought it was an important thing to write about because, for one, it's on a huge spectrum. A good friend of mine, within months of me starting the blog post, said, you know, Margaret, a lot of people's kids don't leave very well. And so can you address the lack of launching that happens? And a lot of kids go back home. A lot of kids get on drugs. A lot of kids just simply seem to be afraid of adulting these days. The fact that your kids have left and are successfully leaving. One of them left at the age of 15 and moved to Minnesota halfway across the country. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what that's about. Hopefully it's all good. Oh, yeah. He's a hockey player. He's pursuing his dreams of playing hockey. Pursuing his hockey. I had some patients who have kids do that. Good for him. So there are lots of kids who are scared. They don't have the self-confidence. That's due to a lot of helicopter parenting and not allowing your children to make mistakes or make decisions for themselves or being way too involved in their lives. Or a lot of kids, their academic performance is bad or, you know, whatever. I could go on and on. But I think that empty nest, what I have really tried to do as has my husband in his own way, not in the way that fits me at all, but I really tried to develop myself. We have a very loving relationship with our son. He's 29 now, and I'll never forget something he said to me a couple of years ago. I was telling him how proud I was of him and the man he was becoming and all the things he'd done since he left home. And he looked at me and he said, well, mom, I'm proud of you for the same thing. (laughs) So we begin to think, oh, I'm too old to try that, or I wanted to do that in my 20s or 30s, but uh, I don't know. It's kind of, I don't know. It's a lot of energy. Or, but I mean, you have this podcast. That's great. Stay curious, stay open to things that are available to you that you are wanting to do, wanting to learn, wanting to try. That's what will make emptiness so much easier. I agree. And I like giving our listeners tangible takeaways, right? So kind of like you putting that advice and guidance online or that information to help the masses, right? Mm -hmm. What tips do you have for our listeners in regards to addressing their own mental health? What are a couple of things that they should be thinking about with regard to their own mental health? I think one of the things that I would ask people to consider is When they think of mental illness, what kind of image comes to their mind? I shared with you a few minutes ago that I have panic disorder, that I've had anorexia. And often when I'm speaking to groups, sort of toward the end of the session or the seminar, I'll say, so again, I'll ask that very question. What do you think of when you think of a mentally ill person? And I'll let them think for a second. I think, anybody have an image of me come to mind? And they kind of look at me and I go, I have panic disorder. I have a mental illness. We tend to think of the severe forms of mental illness that are highly debilitating. But we don't think of milder depression. We don't think of something that someone might be covering up or someone might be just dealing with on a daily basis. We tend to think of mental illness as sadly 
people who've killed people in schools, which actually those people, some of them do have mental illness, but most mentally ill people aren't violent at all. So I do think people have to address, do I not want to admit that I'm depressed or admit that I'm anxious or admit that I can't get what happened in the war out of my mind or I I had a financial crisis and I can't forgive myself for it. I'm becoming a perfectionist. I'm obsessing about being financially successful because I can never fail again. There's this fear of the shame you're feeling about this failure or struggle you had. So it's how you think about struggle, mental struggle, emotional struggle, what you were taught about it. We don't talk about our problems. That's weak. That's a failure. So that's huge. As far as just mental health is concerned, I'll trot out the tried and true, look at your physical life, look at your emotional life, look at your financial life. All of those things have to be balanced. Mental health is a huge concept and people who are mentally healthy, I think, have a lot of self-acceptance. And what I mean by that is my working definition of self-acceptance is that your strengths don't define you any more than your vulnerabilities and vice versa. I thank you for sharing that. We talk all the time. I talk about the three-legged stool with the families we work with. And that stool is your physical health, your mental health, and your financial health. And if you have a tendency to lack or have an issue in one of those areas, it certainly affects the others. You have issues in the others. So it's important that we make sure that we address maintain and take care of all of those things. You can't just say, hey, I'm going to take care of my mental health and forget about my physical and financial because that's just going to affect the mental health and make it more challenging for you to address that. So it's very important and they're very tied together. So I thank you for sharing all this great information and your own personal stories. We end every show asking each of our guests the same question because this is the Midland Money Mindset and we're all about joy here. And that is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? Well, I know the first thing I do almost every morning, and that's go for a walk. And it's a beautiful fall day here in Arkansas, and it smells great, and the trees are turning. Then I went to go work out with my trainer for just a half an hour, and I did heavier weights. (laughs) But you know what brings me joy so much? I also checked on my son is just to relate my friend who came for my birthday. It's connectivity. I just think whether it's with nature, whether it's with yourself, your faith, your relationships, I think what brings me the most joy is connectivity with something outside of myself, somebody, something, some feeling. That's what I would hope people start their day with because so many of us feel so isolated. Sounds like a great way to start the day and it works for you. So that's all that matters, right? At the end of the day. So listen, Dr. Margaret, we're going to have all of your information in the show notes. If people, though, want to connect with you, learn more about you, learn about the book, the podcast, et cetera, what's the easiest and the best place for them to do that? My website is drmargaretrutherford.com and it's got everything. It's got a contact sheet of how to contact me. Of course, you can listen to my podcast at the Self Work Podcast. And I usually give my email out there. It's askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, which is way too long. And I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I really make myself pretty available to people. I have a Facebook group, I'm on Instagram. I'm not on very many other social media places. Pinterest, I do have a Pinterest account that somebody else manages, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I appreciate you sharing that. I encourage people to check out your book, check out the podcast, and definitely visit your website to learn more. And I thank you today for your time and enjoy your day. Thank you, Larry. I will. You too. I want to thank Dr. Margaret Rutherford for being a guest on the Midland Money Mindset. Dr. Margaret's passion for making the world a better place is seen in everything she does. The passion she has for lowering the stigma around mental health and suicide is heard in her voice when she speaks about the topic. Having conversations like we had today will only lead to reducing stigma and allowing those affected by mental illness or depression to feel comfortable enough to seek the help they need. So please keep the conversation going. 
Dr. Margaret Rutherford and all that she is up to can be found across most social media platforms. All the contact information needed to find her can be found in the show notes. Thank you for joining us this week on the Midland Money Mindset. Make sure you visit our website at midlandmoneymindset.com and smash the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. We encourage you to help others find our valuable content and please don't keep us a secret. You can also schedule an Is There a Fit call right from our website or by using the link that you'll find in the description section of your podcast player or app. And be sure to join us for our next episode to learn more about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. The opinions voiced in the Midland Money Mindset Show with Lawrence Sprung are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy ensures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Guests on the Midland Money Mindset Show are not affiliated with CWM LLC.